Bonjour. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you here. This is the CTV Society, and we are the CTV people. Uh, my name is Mark the Noble Blue Hammond. I have my friend and superior intellect, Mark Zabatowski, over here. And I'd like to uh, let you know that tonight might be a little different. Tonight, we're not going to just get into raw politics. We're going to do what I consider to be an important service to humanity. We're going to help people, if possible, to see beyond the obvious. But before we do that, let's talk about uh, a little bit of current news. You know, a lot of people uh, seem to dislike the idea that we're going after the UFOs here on this show. But a, guy, a Russian billionaire named Yuri Milner, if we could put that up, number one, John, just gave $100 million to uh, the, a project called the Breakthrough Message. And he's going to use radio telescopes from around the world to try and contact extraterrestrials within our lifetime. So here's a guy that's putting out $100 million just because he can, just because he wants to know. See, we're not just the weirdest uh, people because we like to look into these things, although we maybe are. But something else happened this week. Uh, Charlie Rose came on and said that the NASA had just released classified sound of the moon singing from the first trip around the moon by uh, American aircraft or spacecraft. And uh, it made this weird sort of uh, electronic kind of weird screechy sound. And it just got released this, this year. But it was classified for the last how many years? Since 1969? What is that? That's uh, well, the lem 40 some years. The lunar module, once it ferried the two astronauts back to the third astronaut, astronaut who was in the command module orbiting the moon, was purposely crashed into the moon uh, on the far side of the moon in order to register the other side of the moon where they had been uh, to, to see what the seismic result would be. And it's been said uh, all these years that the, uh, the moon rang like a bell, whatever that means. Mm. So perhaps this is your, the singing that you're talking about. That, that could be it. That uh, it seemed to imply that it has a whole bunch of uh, uniform material like a bell, like uh, a bunch of, th that a bunch of it is metal. Right. It could be artificial. Like iron or even steel or, you know, something. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're attempting to do tonight is to present to you the possibility that everything is not what it appears. Uh, tonight we'll be using a book called Seeing with the Mind's Eye, The History and Techniques and Use of uh, Visualization, 1975. We could have a picture of that up there. Um, this uh, book by Mike Samuels, MD, and Nancy Samuels, MD. Uh, this first one, this first picture, it was made in 1928 by Rene Magritte. It's called uh, The False Mirror. And what it attempts to do is show that the world inside the person and the world outside the person could be the same world. It could be that the, you don't know if you're looking out of an eye or if you're looking into somebody's eye, or like your own eye, with a reflection of the uh, clouds in the background. Uh, it, it challenges you to uh, see beyond the normal interpretation of the eyeball as a one-way street and see it as a two-way street, a possibility of uh, what we might call superpositional thinking. Uh, we'll get more into superpositional, but to, to put it mildly, superpositional means that two things are happening simultaneously that don't seem to be possible, like uh, spinning right and spinning left for an object, like an electron, when they're in a superpositional state. Now, this all goes back to what? The uh, Stronger's Cat idea. Remember uh, Edwin Stronger? He had this experiment. 
the cat is both alive and dead, depending on who's, what who's looking. Until at you it. know for sure that it's one or the other, it's actually both. Yeah. Is what he said. Yeah, and that's right. It's, it's both a, until you know differently. And see, that's what uh, quantum mechanics and stuff is trying to point out to us: that it takes an observer to collapse the wave function, so that we can see that an object is what it is because it's uh, based on interpretation of the uh, mind's eye as to uh, whether the thing is turning left or right, uh, like, for example, with an electron or a uh, positron. Now, this is something we learned uh, this week, was that superpositional meant that until somebody looks, until somebody measures the phenomenon, it's both. It can be turning right and left at the same moment. And that's what quantum computers use, uh, these things called SQUID, superconducting quantum interference devices. They use this phenomenon of superpositional consciousness because that's really what uh, the revolution of politics and society is, is based on consciousness, see how a person looks at something. Let's look at that second uh, picture there. Uh, B, Bedroom at Arlisle by Vincent van Gogh, 1888. Well, this is, uh, that's the next one, but that's Pablo Picasso's Mother and Child, 1921. Now, first, it looks pretty simple, but when you start to look at the, the implications of this picture, you see that the, the mother and the child have a sort of uh, cosmic connection. They don't really quite look real, do they? Look at the arms and look at how Pablo Picasso has tried to portray this energy in a different light. If we go to that next one, the uh, bedroom at our Lyles, you'll see a little bit closer how Vincent van Gogh, how he makes these objects pop out like the bed and the chair. See how they they sort of float above the, the floor, and he's conveying a sense of emotion and not just strict realism, but he's connecting the pieces in his life to being able to see them in a slightly different way so that he can give emphasis to the things that are important to him, the solidity of the bed, the solidity of the table. His need at that point in his life was to have something solid that he could look at. Everything else was kind of swimming around in his life. Let's go to that next one, Claude Monet, talking about swimming, uh, swimming along. The Water Lilies, 1920. Uh, Claude Monet eventually uh, built this picture so that it went completely around the entire room. So that when you went in there, there was a sense of calm and peacefulness that occurred. In the water lilies? Yeah, well, as soon as John gets it up there, the water lilies. Yeah, the water uh, lilies. The, uh, let's see, there. There, yeah. If you could open that book up a little bit better. Or. Imagine that going all uh, the way around the room. Imagine what kind of uh, influence that would have on your mind, the sense of impressionism that he conveys there. Yeah. So you're looking at it right off the bat, all you see is a bunch of squiggly colors. But after a while, you can see that the very use of color and use of pattern affect your mind in a way that you look at reality. So let's go to that next one if we could. Uh, Harrison Begay, 1967, Navajo boy learning the chant. Oh, the other one, John. Yeah, that one. Now, see, this is a uh, this is a Navajo painting. If we could see those those creatures at the top a little bit better, those are uh, that that long one that sort of circles the other four. That's the uh, rainbow goddess. And oh. We lost him. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, there it Rainbow is. Goddess is like nut. Yeah. The Earth Goddess of the Egyptians. Well, these are the Navajos, but the right. uh, 
the idea was that they're conveying an ability for the Navajo boy to learn how to communicate with these forces of existence in the, the minds of the Navajo. These were the powerful creatures that controlled the, the weather, controlled the uh, reproduction of the tribe, they controlled the different animals that lived in their reality. So these, in order to, to connect with life, they had to be able to see a, in a, a symbolic relationship with these other entities. Looks like they, the individual en entities inside of the Ark of the Rainbow Goddess are uh, dipping down little qualities on strings or something from themselves, perhaps down into oh, the yeah. world they, or something. Everything in that picture has some relationship to the mind of the observer, of the Navajo. And they're connecting with these powerful creatures through the chant. See, to them, that was how the world was formulated. It was formulated through these learning these stories, learning how to connect with these deeper forces of reality. Let's take a look at uh, the one right next to it there, John Petrus Christus, the Nativity, 1445 to 1446. Looks like Navajo boy had a uh a two-headed snake there that he was holding. So it's right across from the Navajo boy there, John. It's the, uh, the Chris, Christ portrait. But in this portrait, you look at the arch above the doorway. There you go. Of these, if you can get that picture of the arch above the doorway. If we could uh, lower zoom that out a bit. Yeah. Picture down a little bit. You can see that the columns are held up by Adam and Eve symbolizing the fall of man. The, the carvings at the top, a little bit further, John, show a little bit more. Toward arc, the top. Arc over the heads Toward of the, very the top. nativity scene and portray various stages of Jesus. Where, as oh, he there's was, the arc. Right, yeah. Right. And, and if you look, there, you can see all the carvings. Now, this is a painting, but this was, this was in... Uh, 1445, this was how they conveyed the consciousness of their religion back then. A lot of people were not literate, they couldn't read, but they could look and they could see these images. So they were able to exercise the visualization capability of their mind. And see, that's what we're attempting to do here on the show tonight, is to help stretch the mind so that you can embrace symbolic representations and looking outside of the normal, uh, obvious interpretations of things. Let's take a look at F there, if you could, John. Paradise of the Green Tara, 19th century Tonka from Tibet. This is a uh, depiction of how the Tibetan people visualize their alternative consciousness realms. There's Green Tara. She's a manifestation of the Buddha, but she... Uh, she has, for a lot of people in Asia, uh, a sense of green protection. Tara? Green Tara, yeah. Like it's, this is her paradise. See around her, she has her accolades. And if you look up above her head, there's a little Buddha up there that gives her life and gives her power. And all of these forces are influencing the consciousness of the person that's, that looks at the Tonka. See, so he's using the visualization capabilities of his brain to see the symbolic representations of what these images imply, that there is a deeper and more profound reality than the obvious reality of just uh, looking at a painting. Now, we're going to try to <coughs> open our own minds tonight through the science and through the uh, call-in. You know, this is a call-in show. We could maybe put the number up there if anybody's interested in this sort of thing. But uh, our own scientists now have these new tools to work with. And one of the tools that they have to work with is called a gamma ray observer. And it's a a satellite that's been out in space using gamma rays to pick up previously unknown aspects of our own Milky Way. 
And one of the things that we had um, not known was that there was the bubbles. The, universe, the Milky Way galaxy that we're in is creating these bubbles from these jets that are streaming out of this massive, supermassive black hole that lies at the middle of our galaxy. And it, as it streams out, it creates these what they call Fermi bubbles that are based on gamma rays. Now, there's a picture of it. And you see that blue light that, that's around the, uh, the, the jet Central coming out of the middle? Central of the jet, yeah, around it. Those are the bubbles. Now, we never saw that before until we had the gamma ray observer. satellite, the gamma ray observer. We never, uh, it never crossed our mind to think that our galaxy would have these incredible bubbles that were being blown out into space because we couldn't see them. What are the bubbles? Are they time space? They're gamma rays. They're, they're gamma ray bubbles. The gamma ray bubbles is what they are. Fermi bubbles is the name of them. But see how our world is opening up because of the new technology that we have? Now we can see things that we couldn't see before. The uh, bubbles are, have always been there, or have they? You know, there's, a, there's a big question mark. How much of reality is there? And when how much when do that we bubble see? hits a habited planet, uh, does that uh, cause a lot of destruction? Well, the most powerful uh, objects in the universe are quasars that we know of, and the most powerful energy field that we know of, the most energetic energy field is gamma rays. It could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And if one of these jets were to, if the Earth were to pass into one of these jets, Goodbye, it's one of the uh, 10, uh, well, ten reasons why humanity could be eliminated from reality. Would be passing in front of a jet. What about in front of one of these bubbles? Well, the bubbles, the same thing. They would rip our atmosphere right apart, off, and yeah. they would basically... Uh, Take it away with them. Yeah, the, the Earth pass. would become a barren wasteland. But uh, fortunately, we're not... It has not happened. Hopefully, we're, we're in a the, more uh, safe area. We're out in the disk area yeah. of, the ga of the galaxy, yeah. so... It's preventing us from being recycled for the time being. Yeah. Uh, let's go to that next book, if we could, John, The Outer Limits of Reason, What Science, Mathematics, Logic Cannot Tell Us, by Nosen Yakovsky. Now, this is a picture of the Mandelbrot set. Now, this was discovered by Benoit Mandelbrot back in the early 90s at the IBM laboratories, the, the supercomputers. And it first came out as a, uh, uh, what appeared to be fuzz on the uh, computational images that they created. But if you look at this object, it's a finite object, see? It's not everywhere, it's finite. But look at that edge. This edge, where the light area is, <coughs> is between two realities. It's an infinite it's a finite object with an infinite boundary. In other words, we could go down the boundary lines of these edges, and we would constantly be seeing more and more, seeing detail. More and more detail infinitely. infinitely. The, the, uh, it's kind of hard to uh, imagine that, but if you can run your mind down this edge, you would see all kinds of swirling, paisley-like right. patterns. Computationally, it has no inward ending. There's no ending. There's no ending to it. It's a finite object with an infinite boundary. What in seems, space, yeah. Blue. It seems impossible, but there it is, right in front of our eyes. Now, this uh, idea of the outer limits of reason as to how, how is it possible that we can have seemingly impossible objects like this Mandelbrot set within our reality. Now, admittedly, that is a mathematical computation. But if you look uh, out to, into nature, you find that most of the natural objects in our world are very much like the edge of the Mandelbrot set. Imagine you were flying in on, an air, on a spacecraft coming in to the shoreline of, of England, for example, or Norway. Or Alaska. Or anywhere. And as you got closer to the Earth, the, the shoreline would become more and more defined. But be, depending on how you measured that shoreline, 
Sure. If you use smaller and smaller measurement devices, you have a, a larger and larger. You have a larger uh, and larger definition of how much coastline you have. Until eventually, you could say that the shoreline of is Norway infinite. is infinite. Right. Exactly. You know, because you, you can't tell exactly where the difference of between. <clears throat> I mean, the shoreline doesn't stay still. For one thing, it's a lot like the Mandelbrot said; it's constantly boiling. Uh, and so. What we do in our mind, this is, this is where the real revolution occurs, we consciously draw boundaries so that we don't get caught up in uh, infinities. We make decisions in our minds of good and bad, right and wrong, and uh, winning and losing. And You know, there's an old joke in Chinese... Uh, history about the uh, old man that has one horse. You know that story? You don't know that story? Nope. Well, the old man, he's got one son and one horse, and that's it. And one day, the horse runs away, and the neighbors come over and say, gee, that's too bad. Your horse ran away. You got no horse. You got nothing now. You're totally wiped out. And the old man says, who knows what's good or bad? The next day, the horse comes back, and he has a hundred wild horses that he brings into the pen, and suddenly the old man's rich with horses. He's got horses up. So the neighbors come over, and they go, well, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? You got all these horses now. Now you're rich. And the old guy goes, well, who knows what's good or bad? And the next day, his son tries to break one of these wild horses, and he falls off and breaks his leg. And the neighbors come over and go, well, that's too bad. He broke his leg. Darn. And the old man goes, well, who knows? See? And the next day, the Chinese army comes and conscripts all the able-bodied young men, but they leave his son behind because uh, he's got the broken leg. And, you know, yeah. it just goes on and on. Right. Who does? You don't know what reality is. You decide what reality is. You decide there's a boundary line here. You decide there's an image that uh, when you look up at those clouds, you use a form of uh, mental projection to see the little bunny in the cloud or the dragon or the, the goat or whatever's in the cloud. And so this guy, uh, Nosen Yanovsky, is saying that there are these limits. He's very much like, uh, who was the guy that was in the imitation game? Um, Alan Matthias and Turing. His first book was called um, Computational and Non-Computational Numbers because he was saying that certain things cannot be computed. Like one example is the uh, everything I tell you is a lie. See? That can't be computed because how do you know I'm not lying mm -hmm. to you when I tell you that everything I tell you is a lie? See? It's, uh Kirk and Spock's main trick for uh, killing computer worlds. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I am great, Star you are great. But you know, some things can be computed and some things can't. And that's why that movie, there's one scene in there where that guy goes, uh, what makes you think you, you know, this is an unbreakable Nazi code. And he goes, well, let me try and we'll find out, you know, if it's unbreakable or not. Because he had such confidence in himself in being able to break everything. All right, now we're going to do a little experiment here in visual, using your visualization abilities. Let's put number five up there if we could, John, just the uh, dust jacket of uh, quadrivium. The inside, inside the cover, there's inside a... Inside the cover of number six. As you flip open the book before you go to a page, there's an image. Yeah, I don't know if we'll get it on the radio very well, or on the TV, but the thing there, with, he's got there. the image right there. Now let's take a look at this for a few minutes. Now first, it looks like nothing. But I can tell you, if you were to spend time with this image, your mind would create a panoply of faces, uh, doorways, uh, 
images. So you can't see much there because we, we look at it and we look at the obvious. We say it's just a bunch of squiggly lines. It doesn't have any value, really, other than as a as a uh, interesting something to look at. But open your mind's eye a second. That's what we're trying to do tonight, is open our mind's eye, see deeper, see beyond the obvious. Look into the, what might be called the uh, secret knowledge of geometry, mathematics. There, see, look, suddenly you're starting to see something there. Do you see it? <laughs> yeah, look. Yeah, looks like us, doesn't it? Yep. See? We constantly want to put form around our images, put some kind of box, label, uh, good, bad, we want to interpret. It's very difficult to maintain a ability to just wander through a cloudy-like abstraction. Hmm. Because we're so used to the literal, the uh, not using, since we've become literate and using the word mainly to describe things in our head, we've lost a lot of our ability to visualize things. The ancient people, they didn't have l literal capabilities, so things were presented to them as images, right? The, uh, when they talked, the images expanded in their minds, and they could see the uh, gods up in the clouds, and the, the shaman would tell the tribe about all the different, you know, potato gods and shark gods, and, and these people would sit around the fire in rapt attention because their minds would be alive with images. Where now we read a book or we see some text or we skip over a, uh, a thing, I'll give you an example of how this works. I just finished the book, uh, The Life of Pi, by, um, what is his name, Jan Martel. And maybe a lot of people out there have seen The Life of Pi, the movie. And they think, on the surface, that it's about a boy and a tiger on a boat for 223 days. And my friend, uh, one of my friends, well, read the book, and uh, he thought, what an amazing book. How can you possibly live with a tiger on a boat for three, you know, on this Mercat Island? And then at the very end of the book, when they're asking him after they've rescued him and he's safe, they say, we can't believe this. We can't believe that you live for seven months on a 20-foot boat with a man-eating tiger and weren't killed. And the truth of the matter is there was a zebra, there was a orangutan, and there was a hyena in the, the movie and in the book. And a tiger. And a tiger on this boat at first. Well, eventually the hyena ate the giraffe or ate the uh, zebra, and the, then he, he ate the orangutan, they had a big fight, but then the tiger ate the hyena. hyena. And you get back at the end of the book, and they say, we can't believe this. We can't believe these animals out in the middle of the ocean for all this. So he goes, well, the truth is, my uh, mother was the orangutan. The sailor that fell off the boat and broke his leg was the zebra. And still, even though it's part of the movie, your friend sees it the way he wants to see it, see yeah. it and remembers it that way. And the orangutan, the, uh, oh. the, the uh, hyena, is this brutal cook from the boat. And he turns out to be the tiger because the hyena... The narrator himself, the hero, right? Yeah, he, he says, well, you know, uh, the guy was dying. He had the broken leg, and the uh, cook was getting awful hungry. 
And so he said, well, let's cut the leg off. And the mother says, okay, just to save the life of the sailor. And then she notices that the uh, hyena guy is eating meat off of the leg after they cut it off. And she gets upset. So she gets in a fight with the, the cook, who's the hyena, and they fight. And the hyena eventually kill, bites the head off of the orangutan. And then the tiger bites the head or kills the uh, hyena. hyena. Well, it was really the cook killed the zebra, fought with the mother, the boy in a rage, you know, after the cook killed his mother, killed the cook as, you know, and because he, he had everyone. To. And uh, ate, he ate all he ate all of the people, see, but he couldn't admit it to himself. So he came up with this nice story about these animals. He couldn't say, "Well, yeah, I was a cannibal." Even though you're out on a boat for seven months, you're going to get hungry, and there's the meat right in front of you and these dead people, you know. But in order for him to get through in his mind, he had to create an alternative reality. So he had to have hallucinate beyond what was actually going on into a more pleasant version. And that's what he says to the uh, Japanese guys at the end of the movie. He goes, which story do you want to believe? Do you want to believe the one about the animals or do you want to believe the one about me killing and eating these people? And I like the one about the animals. And my friend, he says that's what it's about. It's about the animals. He didn't even... He didn't even, it didn't even register, Follow it went right over his head, poof. Overt text, yeah. Yeah. Now, we're going to present something to you tonight that is going to blow your minds, and I, I'm hoping everybody out there is ready to sit down and take this in. I hope we got enough time to... Well, you know, your yeah. friend also had a, a view of history that I know was wrong, but at some point I realized that uh, there's no arguing with that unless you know, I want it to p potentially become quite heated. So I gave up on whether or not there was Mary, Queen of Scots, and that that was a different person than Mary, Bloody Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII. And they are two different people. I know, but you can't talk you to can't somebody. You can't talk to them about Once it. they get it in their mind that they uh, have the right image, mm -hmm. that's all they need to know. Now, let's take a look politically how we turn one man's freedom fighter into another man's terrorist. See, if you lived in some of these traditional communities around the world and you saw this, what appeared to be soulless monster of military madness that we call the uh, armed forces of the West, That's dropping thousand pound bombs on your village year every war night. war in the Middle East. And you would pick up guns and go fight the infidels too. I'm sure you would, you know. If we had these people dropping bombs on us like we're dropping bombs on them. But in our mind's eye, we're good. You know, we're the heroes. We're the winners. We're the, the forces of civilization. Even though we're 30,000 feet above them and dropping 2,000 pound bombs on innocent people as well, I mean, I saw Roger Waters there from the, uh, from the Pink Floyd band saying, if you watch uh, The Wall, you see, uh, you see these bombers at the end dropping cymbals on all these poor people and crushing and killing them. And he says, what did these villagers do to deserve depleted uranium bullets coming through their, their mud walls? blowing them apart, smart bombs. What, what did they actually do to us to, reserve, to deserve that kind of a treatment? But to us, you know, we're absolutely, if you listen to these politicians out there on the stump, it's our absolute duty to kill these people, just like I can imagine back in the 19th century they did with the Native Americans. Well, one way to look at it, I, I don't really see that we're benefiting in any way by these 15 years of war in the Middle East, but one way that perhaps there's been a benefit is that it artificially kept the price of oil you know, up above uh, $4 a gallon for you know, over 10 years, 
Uh, so a lot of fortunes were made in the United States by people who had invested in oil by, by doing that. Uh -huh. The other thing is, uh, by constantly having this chaotic, unsolved uh, situation and 15-year war, uh, the United States guarantees that we're always watching that thing going on over there, like some shadow play that takes uh, part of our energy away from our settling on a way to solve our own problems. Uh, another thing is that it justifies you know, a military that's bloated way out of proportion to any possible threat that will ever happen. You know, the U.S. is so prepared for war that, uh, hey, what's it about? I, you know, just whatever it's about, it's not about what it seems to be about. Is this anywhere close to anything you're trying to get at? Seen or? beyond the obvious here. No. No? It would seem to me that if, <laughs> no, that's true. You're, you're right on with what I'm trying to say. It would seem beyond, looking beyond the obvious that there is a lot of money being made off of war, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, Absolutely. Billions and billions of dollars every year going for more and more bombs trillions. and tranks. There's and trillions in Trillions of dollars the out there churning destruction and conflict. And, you know, I've given up trying to think that we're ever going to be a, a peaceful and loving species. Now, maybe we can transmutate some of this horrible death energy that we have for killing each other into sports or some kind of more productive environment. What about a, cr a great creative impulse, you know, like uh, Athens had, you know, during the golden age of Greece, you know, that was, of course, it all, it all well, kind of came apart. crashing down in an yeah. uh, ill-conceived war, of course, but... Uh, right, they all uh, got overrun by the, by the Greeks, didn't they? I mean, the Greeks got overrun by the Spartans, the Spartans. Well, they got, yeah, they got the involved Peloponnesian in a, wars and so. a, a interstate war but with other Greek states, right, that brought them down. Now, this is where we get into the, uh, the mind-blowing part. Um, back in 17, 1975, a man named Trevor James Constable wrote a book called The Cosmic Pulse of Life. Here it is. And... He says that there's a revolutionary biological power behind the UFO phenomenon. He says that in our atmosphere, there are invisible entities of some sort that can be picked up on infrared film, gamma ray film, and the new uh, science of antimatter light, which and this is 1975 when this guy wrote this. He's saying that from his own experiments that he's been able to show, and we have several examples, and you can find out more on the internet, yes. of entities that are following our spacecraft up into outer space. They look like amoebas, they're, they're an amoeba. Kind of pulsating donuts, kind of neon, but uh, pulsating brighter and then darker uh, continually. Yeah, they're pulsating. They're yeah. pulsating uh, amoeba-like an entities. Sort. And uh, if you look for the documentary Conspiritus, that's one sure way to uh, see a lot of these, uh, these flashing donut things that are out there that the space station and space shuttle people have seen yeah. for decades. So you can say, well, you know, I don't believe it. I know. It's, I think it's it, NASA's I think you're own crazy. film. You I know. think you're crazy, Blue. I it used to be crazy. NASA had live feed from the space station yeah. and from space shuttle shots. But at a certain point, there was so much alien activity that people were uh, seeing over the internet because they were, oh, what's, oh, look at this. And they were telling their friends about it. And people would collect the video and get it on the internet. and they decided no more live feed, there's going to be a delay. And so frequently, NASA says, oops, we're having technical difficulties. That's when the camera is full of these things. These things. Yeah. Now let's go to number seven there, if we could, John. You know, it's one thing to see a, a little book that a guy wrote. It, he could be imagining things. But this article is from the American Journal of Modern Physics, fall 19... Uh, fall 2015, about a new type of telescope 
that's been invented using antimatter light. Now, uh, we just saw the cosmologists from NASA saying that part of the breakthrough in the future could come from us understanding the nature of light that we don't normally look at. And one of the new theories is that for everything in our universe that's based on electrons, gravity, for example, bends light like in a gravitational well. But according to this new form of mathematics they call isoduetic, they're saying that we live in a, a universe that's based on symmetry. And everything in our universe, where things bend in towards the gravitational well, will bend exactly the opposite way in antimatter light. Antimatter light is made up of positrons. And if we could go to that picture of the telescopes there, John, next to it. These, this man, his name is Ruggiero Maria Santinelli, has said that by taking this theory that everything in antimatter does the exact opposite of everything in matter, he's created a dual telescope system where one of the lenses is concave, the one we normally see, or, or convex, I should say. That's the light that we normally see that refracts into our eyes, and we can see visible light rays through these concave lenses. Mm -hmm. But by doing the exact opposite, using convex lenses, the telescope will pick up antimatter light. Why? It will, it will pick up light that is being bent the exact opposite way. And if we could show that last picture there, John, this is what we would see that are floating over top of many of our military bases, following spacecraft up into outer space, probably on the moon, oh, probably these, all over. The pulsating donut things? These pulsating donut things. Yeah, that last picture, there it is. Yeah, exactly. You see these over and over again. What are these things? Yeah, now I know why you use the eye. <laughs> uh, the Magritte eye. It's yeah, kind see? Kind of is uh, bringing it together as a theme in a way. Seeing. Seeing beyond, beyond the, the obvious. obvious. Yes. These things, according to these new telescopes, are everywhere. Yeah, and they look just like uh, John is able to make it this is a very good yeah. effect here, John. Bravo. That's the pulsating, the pulsating the energy. Part, yes, that's exactly what it comes across as. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the effect, and that's what it looks like. And now, something like they this follow is... follow and find our spacecraft uh, in Earth orbit. They follow our spacecraft. They, they seem to be... Interested. Very in interested in our military bases in particular. Oh, so they're in orbit over our bases. So there must be some form of intelligence behind that. But we don't see them until we use these new telescopes that let us see with this gamma ray light, this infrared light, this, uh, and we see outside of what's normally visible. Are you saying that using these telescopes that pick up the antimatter light, they're seeing them in orbit, or, or they're seeing them over the bases? They're seeing them over the bases. Well, yeah, but they're seeing them with ordinary light, and ordinary uh, they're th just seeing them with their ordinary human eyes no. outside of the uh -huh. spacecraft. Oh, uh, well, maybe they are. Yeah, they are. They have for years. So. Yeah, but well, that might be uh, because they, uh, there's something that happens differently outside of our atmosphere. Maybe this is when they don't mind humans seeing them. They're interested in what the reaction is, perhaps. One of the ideas is an influence. Maybe that they actually the bend the light right around our eyes. Uh, instead of light bending into our eyes, these, this light bends outside of our eyes using these antimatter waves so that they, they can't be visually, they're invisible. We call them invisible terrestrial entities. We call them the Archon. You can find them on the uh, internet if you want to check it out. But tonight we're, we're doing what it takes in order to see beyond the obvious. 
Now, one of the things in uh, recent politics, some of the ideas that we've come up with are, uh, like Donald Trump might have been put up by some ultra-liberal uh, left-wingers to destroy the Republican Party. Maybe that was his, maybe they knew Stealth that. mission? Maybe that was his mission, was to destroy the Republicans, to give Hillary the If that's the, presidency. the case, it seems to be working. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, that still means that... Because look at his friends were the Clintons, right? For a long time he's going, I love these people. That's an interesting point, yeah. I mean, uh, it's strange, but he was at the... Uh, the Clintons were at his most recent wedding with his most recent imported uh, wife model uh, from Eastern Europe, and so he knows them socially. So that, so that yeah. How do we know, know that what we're being told through the media is what's really happening? Exactly, yeah. Uh, you and I have done many shows, and I think more than most shows on CTV, uh, our particular shows, you and I, uh, have focused on a kind of um, shadow seeing world. is not believing, that, there's, that there is something else, that there's a kind of uh, shadow image, false world, and something else going on beneath it uh, in, in many ways. And, you know, for me, yeah. that, and, and I, I, I guess for you too. And, uh, and well, we're not alone. Look at the uh, X Files. I mean, pretext for this unending Middle East war now that's gone on for 15 years. Yeah, and it's like people are just cannon fodder for this stuff by these. Well, and people somehow, people that have all this time, ambitions. have never reacted to the leaking away of our economy uh, into China, and that's crazy. Well, one way that that's happened is they've been distracted by this unending war thing, so it just happened, and now suddenly they're, they're getting all upset with, uh, and it's being expressed as Trump and Bernie in terms of a reaction to the reality that's taking place that's really destroyed uh, the American life that these people had known as you know, middle-class Americans, and now that's uh, apparently become a thing of the past, and now at last there's some kind of reaction to that. Well, another thing would be like uh, Bill Gates, the richest man in the world, $75 billion of personal fortune. Now, I talk with people and they go, well, he gives a lot of money to helpful causes. And he I produces go, all of his software. All right, let's say he uh, gives a billion dollars a in year. In China or India. <laughs> that leaves him $74 billion to play with, you know. They go, well, he doesn't have to give any money. Well, that's true. He doesn't have to. But he employs a couple hundred people, you know, in, the, in Silicon Valley in the Northwest who uh, have a great job and uh, produce, you know, some software, but slowly even those jobs are leaking away. Well, he gives to, a smoke screen, right? To uh, uh, is, uh, India. So what is it really? Pay know? no attention to the man behind the curtain because right. uh, he makes it appear, and same with Warren Buffett, Let's that they, are, the they are just creator. the greatest, most wonderful, philanthropic people. That, you know, yeah. look how marvelous they are. He gave a billion dollars away this year. Well. Rather than he having the billion dollars to decide uh, what he's going to do with it, it would be a lot nicer if society itself could decide what to do with that surplus wealth. Well, who's and society, though? Society is more like the political process rather than Bill Gates himself as one person. Well, I don't know. You know, the, here we have a classic schism between the left and the right, because the left are about let's get Make along. Life better let's, for people. Let's help more. Right? people to get along and the right is basically I'm in it for myself my family my clan my my uh, money right or wrong yeah my, my money. money private full stop I want to own all the land we just saw this movie uh, Red River with with uh, John Wayne in it and they go down to tech this is in the early early days uh, it's got Montgomery yeah. Cliff in it too right and they go down to the Mexico, and they uh, say, I'm taking all this land. And one of the guys for the Don comes and says, this is Don Pedro's land. You can't take it. And John Wayne says, tell Don Pedro he can have all the land south of the Rio Grande. But everything north of the Rio Grande is mine. And the 
Mexican gunman goes, well, Don Pedro's not going to like that. And John Wayne goes, well, you're supposed to do something about it? And he pulls his gun, and John Wayne kills him dead. Kills eight more people for the next 15 years that all have the same idea about who's gonna, who owns the land north of the Rio Grande. See, back in the day, you were worth what you could take. See, it was power, might made right. And it's not that much different today. Look at uh, Putin. He goes, I want, uh, if these guys are going to give me a lot of grief, I'm going to take Crimea. And nobody's going to do a thing about it. In fact, I'm going to get all the Crimean people to kind of vote that they want to secede. And we did the same thing back in Panama. Unless they're the Crimean Tartars, the Mongols, in which case they... Uh, poor uh, young guys uh, who are objecting end up uh, hung inside of warehouses. And, and see uh, what in happened in Panama. Panama. You know, Panama used to be part of Colombia. But Colombia didn't want to give the rights to the, uh, the canal, to the Americans. So Teddy Roosevelt went and got all these rebels down in Panama and said, we're going to declare our own country here. And they had a, a, and a war. And on board and uh, yeah, be and in on this? Or they set out? up Panama as an right. independent country. That's how Panama happened. Right? And that's how Panama happened. See, now what, what's real? What, is it, was it Colombia? Was it Panama? How? It was Colombia, but the U.S. Ma turned it into Panama in order to take it away from Colombia. To yeah. To now through it. You know, right. we, uh, we started that war with Spain, you know, sinking of the Maine. It turns out that we blew ourselves up there in the Maine, more than likely, and the Spanish didn't have anything to do with it. But what, who was that guy, uh, the big newspaper baron out on the coast there, uh, William Randolph Hearst? Hearst. Yeah. He goes, uh, you give me the headlines, I'll give you the war. And we ended up after that war with the Philippines and Puerto Rico well, from Spain. <coughs> took after, them. After and, the US and then took after the, the, the worst thing is after we got the Philippines. We didn't get give we, people their freedom. We didn't give people their freedom. We we killed virtually the entire native population that resisted. I mean, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. The, there are estimates that the U.S. Army actually killed five million Filipinos in order to put down the rebellion. There were just whole villages and, and parts of the country that were exterminated, men, women, and children. Mark so. Twain went there, and he said he was so disgusted by man's inhumanity to man that he... Uh, Arguably a genocidal war. But yeah. Uh, I mean, if they'd kept resisting, I suppose it would have been. But that's not what we heard back outside. here. We heard our brave boys are over there fighting against these uh, terrorists. And Well, one way it was kind of explained at the time was that this was a kind of Indian. And when the war was being fought, the uh, American military people involved saw since they're Asians and they're primitive, that this is an extension of the Indian Wars and that th this is some kind of Indian out here. Uh, to this day, you actually do find um, some Americans refer to the Siberians uh, as Indian tribes. So this is part of the legacy. I mean, I won't even history. bring up 9-11 because that's just so obviously a uh, false flag attack. It's ridiculous. But all of our history is replete with this. The winners write the history books. See, uh, and... We, as a population of free-thinking individuals, have to be able to see beyond the obvious. We have to be able to see through the Donald Trumps of the world, the Hillary Clintons, all the people that would basically use us as their play toys so that they can... In, you know, when the Clintons... I mean, I like Hillary and all, but when they left the White House, they made over $100 million in just speeches. You know, who's, sure, you only make uh, $400,000 a year as president. But when you get out, you know, Reagan, well, he made $7 million the first speech he gave after he well, left the presidency. Uh, you know, big banking interests, uh, Wall Street interests, have, have paid them a lot of money to go around making speeches. 
So they know, you know, who their friends are. And uh, no, I like Bernie. Around kind of as their reps. Yeah. You know, Bernie made uh, picked up forty-two million dollars in the last month. But not from those same people that are no friends from Clintons. little people. And I agree. I think from the on the surface of thing, Bernie sounds like the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, much but, greater. You know, yeah. much greater than sliced bread. <laughs> but also, I have part of me has to say there's forty-two million dollars that if he doesn't spend it, where does that money go? It goes to Bernie, doesn't it? No. Are no, you sure? It would go to. Are you sure that doesn't go to where Bernie wants it to go? Uh, I, I think that he can't just, you can't just claim with stuff like that. You've got to spend it. So Bernie's willing to spend it, and that'll have a heck of an impact. I don't know. I think some of these guys do that as a retirement golden parachute. I don't think so. Now, I, I, I hate to be so cynical, that. but we have to think outside of the box sometimes when it comes to politics, because what you get is not, I mean, just look at all the lying that goes on in politics. Promise. Promise, promise, and deliver nothing. Promise everything it takes to get into the office and deliver nothing. You know, well, what for one thing, I think for sure, people shouldn't be voting for Hillary Clinton after all the promises that she's been a part of. Uh, going back to her involvement with Bill, of course, you know, the whole, you know, uh, campaigning against NAFTA, for instance, uh, and then going with NAFTA. It's and then at the, the end of the Obama administration, Hillary's part of giving us this Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is another, another betrayal, boondoggle. really. It's not a boondoggle. It's, it's exactly what they said they wouldn't do, and it's they did It's a bamboozle. So don't go with the same people that you know. Don't fulfill their promises, that, because they're being dishonest with you. At least go with someone else and see if they can be honest with you and produce results. That's what I say. So that's seeing beyond... I mean, that should be obvious. That should be seeing the obvious, you know. Right. Actually, I it could be seeing the obvious. But, but the hidden. news media won't remind you of that. So in a way, the obvious is people look to the media like that's the image of the world. But the unobvious is think for yourself. Exactly. we got to learn to use our individual minds to see. We can't rely on authorities. Hey, thanks a lot. Is that donut? Thanks for putting up the uh, donut. I was going to ask to do that at the end. You did a good, you did some nice special effects. Yeah. Okay. yeah, let's see it pulse again. Pulsing the donut? Can we pulse the donut? Well, I don't know if we did any good or not. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think to, uh, we brought the donut forward into reality for people, the Archon. Uh, Quote the former governor of Vermont. Yeah! <laughs> there it is. Yeah! Look at that thing. It's pulsing. Oh, there it is. Right. Great. Ooh, baby. Man, Special what? effects oh, by. Special.